Okay. Right. Probably going to give us a little message here. Record it as well, just in case. All right, let's pray. Good and loving God, we give you thanks that you are a finder, that you come to us and reach to us, and uh, and you invite us into that um, that aspect of your kingdom of of seeking and finding and celebrating and rejoicing. So give us your joy as we study your word. Give us insight and connection to one another and to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll start with the gospel today. I'm I'm doing sort of a I don't consider it really a confession necessarily, but the the first testament or the old testament reading is Moses arguing with um with God about God's like, I've had it. I'm gonna wipe them out. And Moses does this kind of arguing with God. Well, what about what about if I mean you wouldn't want that on your reputation, God? You wouldn't want people to think you just took took us out of Egypt just to wipe us out. Come on now, you don't want that on your on your record, sort of a thing. It's this kind of odd conversation, but sort of beautiful when you dig into it. However, um, if you think it's been 21 years since 9-11. So that's divisible by three, right? And every three years, we cycle through the lectionary. That was the, the, the reading for 9-11 was God's going to destroy the people and Moses talks him out of it. Probably not the best match, right? Um, and uh, and then it comes up on rally day and it comes up on 9-11 again and again and again. And both of those are happening this, this year. So I said, I've done that <laughs> before. I think I'm not going to try to unpack exodus 32 and i really wanted to focus on these parables that we have before us so um but a lot of confessional kind of uh rendering of the heart kind of stuff that's going on here um so we'll kind of start at what i would say is is in a way kind of the end with the gospel reading here today which kind of brings some of the other pieces together uh but whoops let me share my screen here and we'll get into that oops i'm sharing with us okay well, let's look at the gospel and this will be if you want to follow along or open your own bibles it's luke 15 1 to 10 that we're looking at and again you guys have been great bringing some of those other, other versions it's been kind of fun to see how different things are in there all right. I have that book that you referenced yesterday, the parables by Went. Should I go get that? Oh, you got it. So okay. This one, yeah, yeah Pastor Paul yeah. gave me his his copy here. So um yeah, I was looking through that last night. Kind of my bedtime story. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to read that for us? So Luke 15, 1 to 10. You can read it up there or in your Bible version, whichever. Oh, you want me to? <laughs> I heard two voices. I didn't know. Yeah, go ahead. Go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Now, the whole thing? Yeah. Uh, one to ten. One to yeah. ten. Yeah. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety nine in the wilderness? and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be no more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The parable of the lost coin. Or that the woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have just found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Yep, you got it. Yes, just so I tell you. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, so... 
we'll start kind of as we usually do. I'm I'm curious, and and Margo, I know you're at a distance, but but chime in here as well as you like. But what what sticks out to you in these in these parables, or in this reading, even? What happens to the poor, the ninety nine who are left in the open country? Yeah, great question, right? Yeah, I think there's a a, a little interplay going on here. Um, I didn't get this up from Went. I thought he would go into this, but but um, um, I was in fact I was asking yesterday, and as I was asking, Pastor Bill was looking it up. But the um, if you look at verse two, and it says, "And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, or they were murmuring." I think sometimes it says in some versions, and uh, that word would would connect with in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. To the same word that's used for the people when they were in the wilderness, mm -hmm. grumbling against God, right? And I think purposeful by Jesus, purposeful by by Luke as he's writing this to um, talk about those ninety nine righteous, <laughs> as as Jesus kind of interprets this down below, um, that uh, they're left in the wilderness. They're they're not getting it. They're wandering. Um, kind of a thing so because yeah normally what would happen with if you had a hundred sheep you were either you were either very wealthy or a lot of times what would happen is you know fam a family would have an extended family might have 15 or 20 sheep per and they would get together with their 40 to 80 to maybe 100 sheep and they would hire usually a, a few shepherds for that many sheep yeah. i think it was like one to i don't know if it was like one to 20 or one to 40 or what it was but Two to three shepherds probably for this flock at least and so the implication may be that the other shepherds would have brought them home but normally what you would do is you would get the sheep home and then you would go off and find the one that was lost so i don't i, think, I don't know if i'm reading too much into this but i think it's an interesting insight yeah they're in the wilderness there are animals that's, why, wild animals that's why shepherds have dogs but shepherds have dogs yeah right that's exactly yeah. what they're for that's what they're trained for yeah do you, do you have some shepherd experience, Margo, or were you around a herding kind of animals or, or that kind of thing? No, not directly. Just, okay. just life experiences. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but that's, what, that's what they're for. I mean, that's why you have, today we have collies or we have the sheep dogs, seven sheep dogs that, um, or the, you know, anyway, that, that's, that's what they're for. Yeah, they're protectors, right? Well, they got they 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 can actually go out and they're if they're trained well, they can go out and herd the sheep in when it's time to be be coming in. Right, right, yeah, yeah. It's actually that could probably be a YouTube rabbit hole just watching like the best sheep dogs <laughs> in the world go. No, honestly, I mean that it's uh that would be interesting to see just the talent that they have. So, yeah. My dog just keeps dropping a ball at my feet, but he's supposed to be a shepherd. I guess that's probably why he's bored to death. <laughs> but yeah, and and they went to. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they used uh, animals at all in the first century. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a biblical reference ever to a sheep dog or a, <laughs> or maybe not a sheep dog at that point, but any other kind of animal that was used for that. I can't think of anything. Can you, Kim? Yeah. No. Just pastors. Just pastors. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I'm the border collie, and Pastor Bill's the sheepdog. I think that's what we decided. But yeah, you're right for sure. Um, and there, and there would have been a team here if, if that's assumed on the part of this. I don't know, but there seems to be a connection to, to the wilderness. You know that they're not getting it, at least part of that audience anyway. So yeah, yeah, great. I like how um, I said this yesterday I think, that the tax collectors and sinners were trying to hear him. So his words are having an effect on these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The word has power, right? Yeah. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And it's so that one of the bigger lies there is. Yeah. So then these two <laughs> parables, and really the one of the prodigal son that follows too, are just promises, you know? he's he's done some hard talk i think before mm -hmm. before this and these three stories are just promise mm -hmm. which is just beautiful yeah. so he doesn't 
he doesn't warn the Pharisees and the scribes or, you know, um, tell them what's coming for people that don't believe. He just gives the story of promise. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And they hear it. So I just wonder, I've always wondered, you know, you hear of some Pharisees that have been changed, like mm -hmm. um, Nicodemus and uh, well, Paul afterwards, but sure. I wonder how many sure. actually kind of heard and believed yeah. that aren't mentioned, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You would think there would be, would be some more mm -hmm. religious leaders is for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder too, how many of them stuck if that, where, where interest became discipleship. You know, a lot of people are interested in Jesus, but where did that, where did it take it to discipleship? Uh -huh. And maybe you're hitting on something there that, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about there have been several places where people are trying to make changes and they're changing things that are longstanding um, in churches. They're changing them in schools. Schools have done incredible shifts in the last few years. I watch it with my with my wife and working with the principal and working with the teachers and and all that kind of stuff and the shifts of power and equity and all these kinds of things that are happening. Um, are really making sea change. And um, I remember my wife was showing me this, this training video that they did, and it was this guy who's dancing. He's just kind of dancing in this park. It's a real video. It really happened. And he dances for a while, and just everybody's sort of just watching him, like, what the heck is he doing? And then this guy in a green shirt, <laughs> person in a green shirt, gets up yeah. and dances. You've seen this? Or I was talking about it, maybe. And he starts to dance. And then it's a little bit longer and then somebody else comes to dance and then pretty soon it's, you know, it becomes exponential and everybody, dancing. except about 15% of the park is dancing. And in the training, they talk about how, um, you know, somebody needs, there's gotta be somebody who starts it. <laughs> and that's oftentimes the hardest part. But then if you're seeing what they're doing and it's like, this makes sense to join them and then you know, that becomes exponential. And you're probably going to get 15% who are like, but that is what it is. You know, sometimes that's that's how it's going to be. Um, and I, I think Jesus works in that way sometimes. You're right. In 14, he's talking about large crowds are traveling. You know, whoever does not hate father and mother, wife and children. We've had those texts. You know, king waging war, you know, really thinking about what I'm going to do and salt and saltiness, which probably was a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek sort of a thing, a little bit of a joke, I, I think, by Jesus' part, because if salt loses its saltiness, it's not salt anymore, right? But but he does this kind of thing here now where he does. He, he's like, here's the party. You coming or not? Because it's happening. Um, and the angels are rejoicing and singing and praising God. You want in on that? <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 Right. And could you be lost sheep and lost coins? Right. Pharisees. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the the wonder of parables is is it's like wait who's he, he's talking about the tax collectors and sinners clearly they're the coin they're the sheep what <laughs> you know are, are they or you know once that sheep is found once that coin is found are there others that are that are kind of lost along the way so. Um, yeah, so it kind of plays a little bit both sides that Jesus is talking to his whole audience. And some of them leaning forward to listen, and some of them are grumbling and, and not sure. But they seem to still be at this car accident of, <laughs> of God's presence. So, all right, good. Yeah, good stuff. I've wondered a little bit about, um, I wondered about the sheep story. And I, I you know, maybe it's sort of a, um, a cynical or sarcastic guy, but I think, okay, you bring the sheep home and then you call together your friends and neighbors. <laughs> What's for dinner? <laughs> the sheep. Yeah, right, exactly. It's like, wait a second, is there going to be food here? Kind of everything. And I know meat was, you know, reserved for oftentimes special occasions and things like that, but a highly you know, more vegetarian kind of diet that they would have had or um, but yeah, it always, I always wonder. And then of course, with the woman, I think, how much did the party cost? <laughs> you know, did it cost a day's wage? Because then kind of there goes your coin. But I think those, that's not necessarily the, 
the, uh, the point of the story here. Um, but another thing I've wondered too is, is when Jesus says, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that one that is lost until he finds it. I wonder if they would say, well, well none of us, we wouldn't do that. We'd write that off as a, you know, 1% loss for the day kind of a thing. But it sounds like in the first century world, no, that would have been, that would have been normal. It would have been normal to go after that sheep, right? But here's what's kind of interesting. We get back to this audience, tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees and scribes. Um, Jesus is kind of playing with something that's that's sort of sort of twisting things up a little bit. Because the shepherd imagery, we know that, right? The good shepherd um, imagery that we have, the, um, the shepherd, um, you know, Psalm 23, uh, we have Isaiah, we have Ezekiel, where the shepherd imagery in Ezekiel is like, you've been horrible shepherds as leaders for my people. I will be the good shepherd for them, where God comes in and says that. So the shepherd imagery, David being a shepherd, all of it is very much held up as this holy thing, as this image even of God as a shepherd. And then leaders, religious leaders, political leaders are supposed to be shepherds to God's people. That's their call. And yet in Jesus' day, and we know this even from the birth story, and we can go back to Luke 2, shepherds were not considered to be, you know, they were not lifted up. So the, so the imagery of the shepherd is, is kind of this beautiful, holy image. But the practicality of who is an actual shepherd is pretty much, you know, part of this unclean sinner population. So Jesus does something interesting with that. He, he kind of elevates that shepherd language up, but he makes it very practical. This is a day-to-day -day thing. Hey, you lost a sheep. What do you, you know, wouldn't you you'd go out and look for it, right? Kind of a thing. So um, there's a little bit of a twist in that. And I think too, then Jesus is taking, you know, these groups of people too and kind of putting them together again. Um, Again, I like that imagery that he's he set the party and he's and he's really inviting them both in in a, in a particular way. This isn't a condemnation of one over the other. He isn't saying the angels are are you know done with those 99. <laughs> They're celebrating this one who's who's come to repentance and forgiveness and mm -hmm. and, uh, and all that kind of thing. So I wonder if the shepherds of the time were <clears throat> more on the side of following Jesus. Because of what happens in the, you know, the first part of Luke, where they're the ones that where, where they leave their sheep. Yeah, right. <laughs> they yeah. leave their sheep to go. Yeah, the right. One. They leave their sheep to go find the <laughs> right. find the child. But uh -huh. I mean, that word would get around the community about this person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah. I don't know. I've kind of wondered from time to time. Mm -hmm. Shepherds mm -hmm. were even these, you know, these grimy men that slept in the fields if they were really right. devout followers yeah you know? yeah yeah right and then jesus using their language you know using mm -hmm. in so many of the stories and mm -hmm. of himself you know that put himself on par with a shepherd yeah is pretty cool for a shepherd right yeah exactly if you are a shepherd to see that kind of elevation even even if they didn't believe he was the son of god even as a respected rabbi that would be a huge elevation um for their kind of for their station yeah so and you can see that all over john of course there's all kinds of good shepherd um, imagery there um, as well but yeah going back to to, to what we were saying about the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him um if you if you picked up on this throughout this year of luke hearing is really really key hearing listening um uh, the word has a real power, uh, uh, and Luke lifts that up as much, if not more than any gospel. So, I mean, you have the word made flesh dwelt among us, the word in, in, incarnate in, in John, you have that beautiful language, but, but the hearing and the, and the understanding and the comprehension in Luke is really, is really key. And that's kind of Luke from the beginning. He's, he's setting out to give an account so that you would hear this, you would understand it, you would take it in and it would be transformative to you. Luke really believes the word has power. Uh, he's encouraging that way. Yeah. All right. Other things that are sticking out here or questions that are coming up or other comments? 
we, we, we spoke of the shepherds being uh, not exactly accepted by many in the community, but yet the shepherds are one of the ones who came to the manger to worship right. Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and Luke, Luke is constantly, you know, scraping the bottom <laughs> and elevating. Um, I, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago that I spent a couple of weeks since I preached, but it feels like I've been gone for a month with all that's gone on. But, but Luke is oftentimes um, focusing on, on bringing down and lifting up. Um, he, he kind of fleshes out the Magnificat that Mary gives in the, in the beginning, you know, uh, continually throughout the gospel. We cast the mighty down from their throne and uplifted the humble in heart, you know, filled, filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no part. So it's not to crush and destroy those in power and, um, and those with means kind of a thing, but it's to bring down and lift up. So there's, there's kind of a level leveling. Um, it's funny, actually, in my last sermon, my, my wife, usually I'll, sometimes I'll ask her, I'm like, so did you, what did you think of this sermon? Or did, did you hear what I was trying to say? I was trying to say this or that kind of thing. And she's like, I don't know. We were, <laughs> we were, we were doing this or the kid had this, the kids had this question or, you know, whatever kind of thing. And she initiated it with me that Sunday and said, she goes, that's what we're talking about in equity. And I said, what are you talking about? She's like, would you, can I get a copy of your sermon from, from my principal? I want to <laughs> see, because that's what we're talking about. And I was like, well, the part you're talking about, I didn't actually have written down. So I said, I'll write it down. But but she just kind of relayed that. But it was, that is something that's happening in Luke is, is there is a leveling. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it goes back to what John the Baptist is bringing up with, with making straight the path in the desert. Um, there's a leveling that happens in that. And so um, I think you see that throughout um, throughout Luke's gospel. And sometimes it feels like really harsh or really like this is, you know, Jesus well, doesn't want to have anything to do with me if I'm like these religious leaders or, or others. But, um, but really it's just a, it's a cutting off all of the stuff that they're standing on. It's fluff, you know, all of this judgment, all of this inside, outside, all of these fences that they put up, Jesus is just mowing them down. And leave. Well, and yeah. he isn't asking anybody to do anything that he as God didn't do himself in the incarnation, right? Yeah. He emptied yes. himself. Yeah. Of his very godness. And... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Paul picks up that up beautifully in Philippians for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. The other, the other thing that I think was cool about mm -hmm. this is the order of being found and then repentance. I think sometimes these texts can be read that you know, the repentance is the key thing. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> you know, that's what gets you into heaven is your repentance. Mm -hmm. Really being found is the key, right? Yeah. yeah. And then it brings repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the being found part is the key. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 If, if anything, the, the, the sort of the ladder climbing stuff that's going on in this in this first century society and our society frankly as well is uh is just completely burned down <laughs> yeah nothing could be more passive than a sheep and a coin right yeah right exactly well luther said that we cannot find god on our own he has to come find us yeah yeah that's what's yeah going on mm -hmm. yeah right yeah and and you know the imagery with the sheep for, for, at least as, as I read it is is interesting because the sheep you know at some point the shepherd is calling the sheep together there's there's a voice you know, Jesus talks about that you know, the sheep hear my voice not Luke but the sheep hear my voice and I'm the good shepherd I lay down my life for the sheep that that language we get in John but um but it's it's referencing something that's familiar shepherds do have a call or they have a something that gets those sheep together um y'all know i'm not a sheep fan we had however many sheep we had the last one was so dumb it was out outside an open barn staring up at a lightning storm and got struck by lightning and died so that's how our sheep worked out <laughs> i never never in my life had lamb that we produced <laughs> or or mutton or anything like that they all died off but 
Um, so they're kind of they're kind of fragile animals. They're easy victims, easy targets, and um, but they're extraordinarily tasty because I have had lamb since then. But but anyway, they are supposed to know. So there's you can put something on the sheep. You can say, well, he wasn't listening. Well, he wasn't following directions. Well, he wasn't. You know, he's turned away. He's done this. He's hidden himself. But what do you do with a coin <laughs> that's lost? I mean, if if I took a whatever I'm going to pull out here, if I took a penny, you know, and and did this, and you know, it rolled off and it's lost, is that any? Can that possibly be the penny's fault? It can't, right? So, um, so the second parable, and they're very much they're very much similar, but it's almost like Jesus is taking it to the extreme, kind of with what you're saying. A coin can't find its owner. Um, only an owner can find the coin. And so there's there's a complete sense of grace and a complete sense of being found. And and I think we can turn that the other way too, and also look at the coin. Um, and it makes me think of of those who just who just see themselves as completely like if 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 they can say, yeah, yeah, I've strayed, I've gone, whatever, and the shepherd finds me and lifts me up and takes me home, kind of a thing. But there are folks who feel so stuck that they're almost like that inanimate object that can't move in their stress or anxiety, in their guilt and shame, in their whatever it might be that's just become that complete block. Is like, I couldn't possibly even cry out. It's just, I'm done, I'm finished. And I think that, you know, that digging that, that Christ does to those, to those souls, to those folks who are around him to hear just how far this goes um, is pretty profound. I don't know. But that's kind of how I see that. I like that inanimate object that he uses as well of being found. Well, and if you think about, I mean, I, this just kind of came to me, the urgency that you said, you know, when you lose your car keys and you're, you're in a hurry to go someplace, mm -hmm. You have that, that gut, you know, I mean, you can feel it here. Like, <clears throat> and so I wonder if God feels that when he's, if he, I mean, yeah. who knows what God feels, right? Yeah. But yeah. It, it's an urgent matter for God, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he went to pretty great lengths to make it happen. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and and just to get back to a little bit of history on the on the lost sheep, there would be some urgency, even if there were other shepherds, even if they brought them home, even if they weren't left out in the wilderness, um, even if Jesus isn't playing with language, but as, but making the assumption with the crowd that they, oh yeah, well of course the other shepherds would bring the ninety nine home, they're fine. Even if all of that's true, there would be some angst um, for uh, the shepherd being out on their own and going off to look for the sheep. It is not a safe you know, place to be out in the wilderness. So, you know, we've kind of declawed most of our wilderness. I mean, we have cougar sightings and bear sightings and things like that, but we've kind of, we've kind of declawed the wild around here. And that wouldn't have been the case for, um, you know, for the shepherd and for the risk that they take. So um, there would have been some angst in the community. It also could have been possible that some of these shepherds would have been, you know, as families get together with, putting their sheep together and hiring shepherds sometimes it would have been a family member kind of a lesser you know lower family member that would have maybe been one of those herded the sheep for the whole family kind of a thing so so there's some involvement with the whole community and again we we really need to read this with community uh -huh. eyes as to how this affects uh, the community and then in the same case the coin being lost could be um jesus has not said and which of you women would because there probably aren't any women there, that would have been an incredible insult to the men who were there. Sorry, but um, but it would have been. So he says, you know, which woman? So you know women, guys. So which which one of them, if they had lost this this coin? Now, is it part of her dowry? Does it have to do something with, um, you know, her, her jewelry kind of thing, or does it have to? What what is it? How is it important is it? It probably would be important. Um, Wentz says it's a drachma. It's a, a which I thought it would probably would be a denarius, a day's wage. Anyway, it's a day's wage. So it's not insignificant, but it would, um, 
Um, but it would also be significant to the economy of the of the community. You know, they're not these aren't just pennies that they're printing out. This would be part of the community's economy, and and finding it would be important. Um, would be an important thing to do. So, um, but yes, you're right. When you lose something, there is there is this urgency of um, <laughs> you know of finding it, needing it, needing it to be whole again, needing to have those ten in place, and not just the nine. So some beautiful imagery there, yeah. Other things sticking out? Is, is the, the lost sheep, is, is that considered to be someone who was in the fold and, and left and you know, decided he was going to like the crime of Sunday or just somebody who hasn't heard about it? Yeah, I mean, for it would be somebody who was, it would be more somebody who was in the fold. So if we're thinking about that kind of imagery, um, and I, and I think in saying that, Jesus is saying two things. Number one, those who you're kind of cutting out here, these tax collectors, these sinners, they are part of your fold. And um, we, we heard, I know last time I preached, it was the woman who was bent over and she was, was raised up. And Jesus immediately, you know, with the protest, like, you know, come here when you're supposed to come here. Jesus immediately says, this is a daughter of Abraham. And what he's saying is, this is this is a, this is your sister. This is a sheep of your own fold. So, by by talking about the sheep as being lost from the ninety nine or being lost from the hundred, he's he's Im implicitly saying it was part of the hundred, kind of a thing. So yes, it would be. Um, otherwise, the imagery would would, on a practical sense, be kind of outlandish. That would be just that would be just stealing from someone else, you know, kind of a thing. Like they're a part of another flock. Even if they were a flock of a foreigner, you wouldn't you wouldn't go and just take it, kind of a thing. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Yeah. So are there ninety nine people who don't need repentance? <laughs> I haven't met them. No. <laughs> no, I have yet to meet the perfect person. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think. Um, I have to I have to read a little deeper into this. I don't I don't know if that would have been sort of the thought that there were folks who were kind of okay um, or considered that way. There were two schools of thought. Let me see if I can find this here. This was kind of interesting. Um, now that you asked that, let's see if I can find it. Um, okay. The telling of a parable about a shepherd is an address to Pharisees, as an address to Pharisees presents a special problem. Oh, and this is talking about that Moses was a shepherd. A midrash on Exodus records the story of Moses searching out a lost kid, so a goat, and being told by God that he will lead that he will lead Israel. David was also a shepherd. Kings referred to by Ezekiel. We talked about that. But there's another there's another midrash where there's a um, kind of a debate about whether people are sort of in in this kind of um, place of perfection or good enough that they would be considered this way. Um, oh, here we go. So we're under repentance as a theme in here. So the parable raises two questions in relationship to repentance. The first is, who is expected to repent? The second is, what is the nature of a repentance? The background of the first question is found in the rabbinic debate over the so-called completely righteous, as that quotes. Some rabbis affirmed that there were indeed completely righteous persons whom God loved in a special way. Another opinion affirmed that God's greatest love was extended to repentant sinners. This debate is reflected in, in the Talmud, which, um, <clears throat> which reads, Sorry. Um, all the prophets prophesied only for repentant sinners, but as for the perfectly righteous who had never sinned at all, the eye hath not seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Okay. So um, in this text, there's a rabbi who's affirming that there are the perfectly righteous. God loves them more than he does repentant sinners. The Talmud then offers the opinion of rabbi, another rabbi who thinks repentant sinners are closer to God than those who are, are considered perfectly righteous. 
he is in turn answered by the affirmation of the first opinion, namely that God prefers completely righteous. So there's this debate that's going on among these rabbis. One saying there are those who are completely righteous and they're the closest to God and they have special preference for God. And then the other one is saying, no, God has a special preference for the, you know, for the um, repentant sinners and not so much. So Jesus seems to almost be playing out this debate as he talks about, um, you know, there's more joy over the repentant sinner. And I don't know, essentially, he seems to kind of answer that question. Nope, there's there's more joy over, over the one who repents. Um, so let me ask you this question. What is that? What does that say to you? Or what is that? Is that something you just see and go, that's really neat? Or does that, how does that involve you? How does that connect you? What action does that kind of ferret out in you as you read this? I mean, we're gonna we're gonna have rally day, so that's an action day. Here we go. I think maybe those other 99 sheep had been lost and found other days, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You're you're only righteous through Christ, and um, so I guess that I just don't worry about it because I see myself as being that sheep that was lost and found. Mm -hmm. So yeah. not just me, but ninety nine others, or yeah. not just one coin, but the nine others at some point may have been lost too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. So you see, your, you you tap into your own lost and found story in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Margot. I agree with Kim. There's so many more things to quote worry about, but that just isn't something that that is something that we have to be concerned about. We know we are lost and we're saved, and every day I struggle to try to live like Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of, of that continual remembering and continuing trying to live with the example that he set for. Okay. Yeah. So so when you remember when you remember that and that gift that you've been given and that salvation that you have through Christ, um, what what is how does that translate into your into your life? You know, does it uh, Translate in a feeling or in an action or both or put you oh, on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably okay. both. I was fortunate enough to to um, never have a big conversion along my way. I was always from from birth raised in a in a home where Christ was center and. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been, I've had an easy life as far as my faith and my walk with Christ. Not that I haven't been on the high mountains and been on the valley, yeah. but overall, it's been an easy walk and the Lord has been with me, you know, guiding me back when I've been that sheep that has strayed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. How about others? What, what is this? Story say to you? Does it say speak anything into your into your life, or does it have any practical reference for you? <laughs> Hope. Hope. How so? Um, well, I I wasn't raised in a Christian family, mm -hmm. so it's um, I was a very stray sheep. <laughs> yeah, okay. but, um, but it's. It's hope coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Do you identify with one story over the other? The lost sheep or the lost coin? Or probably the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. um, probably should. A bit more frugal and identify with the last one. <laughs> the day to day. That's okay. It's, yeah, it's, I don't think it's about being a spender or no, saver necessarily, no, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, from the moment, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's comforting yes. to know somebody's looking for you when you mess up. Yeah. 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 That's the whole part. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. for sure. I think about it for a particular loved one that I have too. That <clears throat> so these were hundred sheep that were part of a flock. Mm -hmm. That all the sheep belonged in this flock. Mm -hmm. They were all under the protection of the shepherd. That right. Be. Right. And then one strayed away, and the shepherd was relentless in bringing that sheep back. Mm -hmm. And so I put my faith that that's going to happen for my loved one because mm -hmm. um, he's not going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there there can be, you know, there can be kind of a jump with this that like, okay, we got to get those, you know, we got to get everybody converted, kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> that's why my it's part of why my favorite song um, has been for years now. But my favorite song is a song called Heathens. Um, I know I mentioned it to you before, and maybe some of you here too. But it's a modernish song, probably two thousand eighteen or something, but. But it says, all my friends are heathens, take it slow, wait for them to ask you who you know. So it's it's this guy struggling with those who are just like, they, when they find the lost sheep, they put a halter around it and drag its butt back to the fold. You know. And what I hear in this, and I know we're talking about Christ's action, not necessarily our action, but I, but I feel an invitation to join in this work, but to join in it in, this, in a very specific way. Um, and I think he got to that kind of in the beginning too with the celebration and all that. But the shepherd like lifts this sheep up on its shoulders and carries it carries it home. I I saw a painting of this. I've seen image of this images of this before, but there's one where it's you know it's sort of the stereotypical European cheeses. But but he's just laughing. He's got his head back and he's laughing and he's just got this sense of joy at the sheep that was found. And there's of course it's always a lamb. It's a sheep in the story, but it's this little lamb around his shoulders that he's carrying back. But there's something about being about being being carried, being lifted by God, and and kind of sharing in the joy of this, of this journey back. It reminds me a little bit of a kid, you know, just on their dad or mom's shoulders, just getting a piggyback ride, and and just the joy and the laughter of that that you're joined together in this in this kind of thing, and not being, um, you know, I think about my dog that doesn't listen to me and strays off all over the place and. And I, you know, if I get a hold of her call, man, it's like get back to the, get in the house and go into, you know, go to jail is her sign to go to her cage. So I thought that would be funny and she obeyed it. So we get stuck, but go to jail, you know, kind of a thing. And if she's barking and carrying on, I'm like, go to jail. And I, maybe sometimes people think that that church is sort of like that, like this, this place where I'm going to have to stop doing all this wonderful things and go to jail and, and be in this, this prison kind of thing. But, but to, but to, but to walk with people as they're being carried, I you know by Christ's spirit is is really a beautiful, powerful image and something we can rally around, I think, as Christians. Um, I've heard people before say of here and other places that they've never experienced this kind of church. And when you dig into that a couple of times, at least, if not more, and I bet Pastor Bell has even more stories like this, but what you hear is that there was, I was invited, I was welcomed, I was, I, I could be all of who I was. I didn't have to fake something or cover something up or not be something. Um, we even had a, a group of very young women who were nurse interns here, which I don't know why they came up here, but they came up to this church and they couldn't believe that we were talking openly about things that were going on in the church, you know, like decisions that were being made and changes that might happen and things like that. They were floored that there was a kind of openness, that there wasn't a secret, 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 uh, secrecy, because that's what they had grown up with was was secrecy. And they were, they were they kept coming for a while while they were on the internship just just because of that. They went to this. It was funny because they came in. These young women came in and worshipped, and then they went into this to the uh, in between class. And I remember. Pastor Bill being like, oh, great. Of all the days to have some young adults in here, this is going to be so boring for them. That's why they came back. Why they came back. I talked to them the next week. I can't believe you guys talked about that. And you were like debating and you were even disagreeing a little bit with each other, but totally lifting each other up and respecting one another. You just, you don't know what God's going to do with how you are, but, but 
aligning yourself in this way as God celebrates and as God lifts um, and as God walks and journeys with and seeks and seeks and seeks and finds, there's there's something that's gonna gonna be seen and rub off in that. So yeah, I think it's kind of a neat text in that way. You know, there's one other thing about this sheet. I mean, you could take this analogy to could grind it to death, but yeah, um, sure. <laughs> you know, if this sheep has run off and gotten to the point where the shepherd can actually catch it, it's probably exhausted. Yeah. It's probably spent. Yeah. And the fact, you know, because carrying a wiggling sheep back on your shoulders, you know, that's no, no. rough too. And so I think about like this person that I love who was baptized as a baby. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hoping it. I just wonder at some point he'll run out of gas. Mm -hmm. And if that's the point that Jesus yeah. really wanted to show up, yeah. you know, seems like that's what happens with a lot of people. They mm -hmm. kind of hit, hit a rock bottom or hit a wall or something. Yeah. yeah. No, so many people have, have like the, you know, coming back to church story that's, or, you know, whatever, yeah. or coming back to faith or feeling like they've experienced it for the first time as their own versus as a child. And it, it often yeah. does sometimes center around something. That's... And I didn't feel, I mean, because I came back, I didn't feel like I was lost. I just got hooked. Yeah. You know, right. But I, um, big time. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of people that you hear their stories about how they were down. And, yeah. And yeah. they got, you know, that's when Jesus went down. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's some beauty in this story and the particular in which it's it's told and pieces that Jesus puts into here is yeah, I think it just kind of has a sense of completeness. You've 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 strayed, <laughs> you're being searched for. You've you know the circumstances around you have put you in a place of being completely cut off. You know, you're being you're being found and rejoiced over. Yeah. So great. You want it. What's that? You wanted. You wanted, yeah. So when a sinner repents, is that a once, one time thing? Oh, yeah. Um, not for me. <laughs> not for this sinner, but um, I, I don't know that it would be a one time thing, but it seems to be that the repentance here is is really a, you know, an event of transformation. Um, this isn't, you know, sorry. Like that change it's, in direction. Kind yeah, of right. Yeah, the, the metanoia, the turning around um, with, what does metanoia mean? With turning, I think it is. So to turn and go in, in a different direction. I think it has more of that sense. So does that mean that they're sin-free? <laughs> no. Uh, but, uh, um, but it seems to be more of what people would tell as their faith story, more, more of an event that would be, become someone's faith story. If that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. The, the funny thing is, um, um, well, I guess it gets back to maybe a little bit what Kim said, the repentance follows the being found. <laughs> and and that you know a coin doesn't repent again a sheep doesn't necessarily repent but there is a restoration and maybe that's ultimately what what jesus is going for here is not um it's definitely not a transaction of any kind it's not repent and then you're, you're kind of put back but um but it's the sense that repentance, that turning, turning, to, turning away from and towards the kingdom, um, has a sense of restoration. <clears throat> so that makes sense. Yeah. The title of the sermon is "Freedom Rally," so that's the <laughs> that's the freedom that we experience, so that we are free to, you know, to come together and to. And to kind of go forward into a new year kind of an exciting year too it's the first year that it feels like to me anyway that we're i could maybe wear that t-shirt you made for me at the big sweet resurrection praise god holy hug reunion someday <laughs> that maybe this is the rally day of the last couple of rally days that uh, 
it actually does feel more like a okay. <laughs> Although, wait a second. Rally day 2022, rally day 2021. Oh yeah, rally day 2020 would have been in the pandemic too. I was thinking, did we only miss one of them? But no, we missed one big time and then we missed another one somewhat as well. A little bit controversial, but what, yeah. is it more about the woman losing the coins and the coin being lost maybe? Just, yeah. Because of the way you know, women were at a lower status and they're, Right. You mean oh you're saying you know, oh you mean rather than the man or, or the coin can't talk you were talking about the coin you know is is not alive right the woman is alive right she's the one that lost the coin yeah so so the yeah yeah right it's culturally it's going back to um, mm -hmm. thought lesser than. Yeah. So would it be a you mean would it be kind of a bigger deal for a woman like to lose the coin versus a man, or would it be more of a blame or that kind of a thing? Yeah. Is, yeah. is, is her husband gonna beat her when he gets home? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Like you've lost this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. There's kind of all kinds of questions that kind of can, can, can come up culturally, like was it was it her coin? Was she earning this wage? How how was she earning it? If, you know, but um yeah, I mean, as far as as the I guess I, I simply see it as as whatever the circumstances. It's almost like Jesus tells the story, like we don't. He doesn't tell the circumstances sort of on on purpose. Um, it's simply lost. She lost it, so yeah, it's kind of her fault, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, but the point the point is that she's she's out of sorts. You know, again that reference to God. It, she's out of sorts. She's incomplete until until you know. And we can go jump to the. The Eucharist at the end <laughs> to kind of see part of her body is is not there, you know, kind of a thing, which sounds sort of weird just to talk about money in that way. That sounds yeah. like we're talking about the uh, Kardashians or something, but um, <laughs> but something of, of her is is not complete until she finds that point. So yeah. I think that sometimes we put too much in some of these things like that. That to me is, is immaterial. The whole point is Christ wants us all to be part of his family and if we stray he's going to 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 come and help us rather than kick things apart like that just like with the with the sheep i'm sure that there was probably thousands of sheep in that herd not just five not just a hundred but to make the story saying one's gone or a hundred have gone but rather than then the whole point of it, or the whole parable, is how Christ wants us to be part. And when we all, when we stray, we all stray. We're human. Then He wants us to to come back to Him, and He will do what He can to help us by showing us, by um, by by helping us. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, in the context of this, um, I think that also then leads us to, to understand, because, and I, I go back to my original thought was, well, would we go back, you know, would we go endanger ourselves for one sheep or have this employee or whatever, or a family member, maybe even, would, would we do that? Or would we just cut our losses? And um, as you were saying that, it made me think, um, do I have that, you know, that the needs of the world can be so overwhelming that we can just shut ourselves off to everything. And do I have that desire for those around me? Do I have that desire for those who are, um, mm -hmm. that they would have, that they, do I have that kind of family feel for, for those who are lost, for those who are cut off, um, for those, the least of these. for the least of these? Yeah. Is that, is that where this moves my heart and not only my body <laughs> to uh, to join Christ in lifting up, but also to join God's heart in a sense of, of do I, is that how I look at my community? Is that how I look at that? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in a sense, if we go back to what this Sunday is about too, you know, um, as a nation, our hearts came together over a tragedy, a tragic loss of life of people we didn't even know. Uh, for the most part, I know there are some, I think we have somebody in our congregation who had a 
a relative, a family member, anyway, that was that died in the Twin Towers. But, but, um, where is that sense of urgency that we might have uh, again for our, and love for our community and, and for those who are that were there and hurting? Yeah, go ahead. Somebody's going to say. Well, I'm kind of going back to the beginning. I mean, how would they? They would have had to have had some kind of head count to know when she was missing. Yeah. So they, I mean, they would have. I, I suppose they had to do it like once a day or something. I mean, they're bringing yeah, the so. I would guess they would get a count, you know, yeah. I've never taken 99 kids on a youth trip. I think the most was, was like 37, but, and there were several shepherds, but, but yeah, getting into groups, counting, making sure you have yours. I, you know, it's, it's a great question. I think about it too, having grown up on a farm, like how do you count? You, you can't just say like, all right, everybody stand still and, you know, or go over here as I count you. They must have had some kind of sorting system or some way with the other shepherds to, to sort through that. I mean, there's no way one shepherd is in charge of 100 sheep. And, and if that, counting them, able to do that. Um, you know, it'd be like having one teacher at an elementary school. It'd be insane. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But they had some system of doing it, I guess, because they, they realized it. And again, I think that's probably accurate as far as what Jesus is saying. This is a practical relatable parable um, because, you know, as I look at Wentz stuff too, and he's digging into the context of everything very kind of scientifically, um, you know, it, it would have been a big deal to lose a sheep or two. It's not a small thing. So especially if your family has kind of conglomerated things together, that's, that may be, that may be more like a loss of one tenth of your flock, you know, of your part of it, um, of those hundred. So, so yeah, it wasn't a small thing for sure. Okay. But that's, right. a, that's a terrible. That's the parable that we are supposed to take from this. It isn't important to even think about how many sheep there were. It's a point that Christ wants us. And when we stray, he is wanting to help us. We stray every day. I'll, I'll, excuse me. I'll clarify. I stray several times a day. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but he constantly is helping me through the Holy Spirit to see my ways. And so the whole thing about how many sheep there were and stuff, that's immaterial. The point is, Christ is, wants us as individuals to be part of his kingdom. And he helps yeah. us when we stay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, ready to move on? Sure. Then beating a dead sheep? Okay. <laughs> that wasn't even a good joke. Okay. Let's see. Actually... I should go back to sharing and just change what I have here. Let's look at, we do have three readings this Sunday. We'll look at the psalm. This is probably a pretty familiar psalm. Um, and actually, I might look at this psalm a little more deeply because I want to look at the other text as well. Um, yeah, Psalm 51, excuse me. And this will also be verse 1 through 10. So we have 15, 1 to 10, and 51, 1 to 10. Psalm 51, first 10 verses. And again, we're only going to read, we're only going to read on Sunday to 10, but I, some of these words will uh, sound familiar to you, I'm sure. And if you've been around a Lutheran church longer than, oh, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 years, you probably will recognize the song that was sung almost every Sunday at the end of this. All right. Have mercy. Well, actually, you want to read? Because, yeah. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my, my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. And done that which is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified in thy sentence and blameless in thy judgment. Behold, I was brought forth to an, in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward being. There, therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Fill me with joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Uh, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. 
And then go ahead through 12, actually. Uh, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Okay. Anybody know the song? Get in me a clean heart. Yeah. A right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Oh, I'm doing that going older than that. Oh, you were? Yeah. What were you singing the ones? Clean heart of God. Everything about the spirit. I, I can't see. Oh, that. yeah. No, no, I think it might just be a different setting, even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were two of us were singing it yesterday at Tech Study. Um, yeah, one thing I want to just point out here, by the way, is um, when it says a sinner when my mother conceived me, that does not mean that, um, you know, that this is not, this is not the, uh, the Puritan. Kind of sense of sex is evil and naughty and all of that kind of stuff. This is more of a sense of from my beginning, you know, sin was part of my reality. So it's not, um, it's not blaming, like you were bringing up before, it's not blaming the mom or blaming the woman or any of that kind of stuff. This is simply a sense of the completeness of, of, of their sin from and being born into that sin. Sorry, I've had a couple calls, but I don't recognize that number. So. Uh, yeah. So this is after the offertory. Why? why what, what's the link between this? And oh, that? is that what it was? I couldn't remember where it was. <laughs> um, yeah. Push it's, the video every Sunday. What's that? So they push the video every Sunday. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you know, all from that side of it. Um, yeah. Why is it after the offertory? So is it after, after the offertory or just before communion? I think it's I think it's more of a transition into commun communion of, mm -hmm. of that sense of coming before God, being washed. Um, and which kind of gets up to a little bit um, above that when it's wash me and make me white as snow in that first, I think it's in the first stand. Yeah, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity in verse two and cleanse me from my sin. So coming before God washed and made clean to come to the table. Yeah, yeah. So this um, verse three was our um, um, uh, Ash Wednesday. Oh, verse. okay. I thought you were going to say it was the theme verse for your wedding or something. And I thought, it was, oh man, yeah. what a pick. <laughs> yeah, right. Psalm 51 is often used for Ash Wednesday. It comes up um, a lot. And I don't know if you have this on the top, but mine says to the leader, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So if we know that story. He's murdered her husband. <laughs> well, he's he's raped, raped her in a, in a sense of having the power over her uh, and the kingdom. Um, She's got a child on the way because of that. And then he brings home her husband and has, uh, he won't he won't go see her because he's loyal to his king. So he can't pin the baby on, on that guy, on her husband. So he sends him into battle and tells everybody to withdraw and, and he's killed. So he's adultery and murder and, you know, lying. And there's all kinds of stuff that he's, that David has done. And, um, and Nathan, oddly enough, says to him, tells him a story about a rich guy who had all kinds of sheep in his flock. And, um, and there was a poor man who had one dear beloved sheep that he, that he was raising. And the rich man didn't want to, had a party, didn't want to take any from his flock. So he goes to the, to the poor man, he snatches the sheep away. As his, as his Lord, he snatches that sheep away and he serves that to his guests as, as the meal. And David you know, stands up and, and says to Nathan, whoever, you know, whoever this, this Lord is, I, you know, I want his head on a platter kind of a thing. And Nathan, and Nathan goes, yeah, one of my favorite verses, you are the man. And it's like, you know, and then supposedly sort of legend would have it. David sits down and writes this, writes this song. Um, and that's his response to the great sin that's been revealed to him. He's been, he's, he's finally kind of caught in this web of what he's done. Um, by the prophet Nathan, who God is speaking through. So, um, so it's a it's a psalm from a <laughs> as lost as you can get as a sheep or a coin 
just completely, completely removed from, um, uh, has completely removed himself from any good graces with God. He's just totally kind of committed them all at once. <laughs> yeah. Verse eight, uh, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. I read somewhere that a, a sheep who was continually going astray, the shepherd will sometimes break its legs. Oh, really? And carry it. It has to be carried all the time. And by the time it heals, it's not running away. Oh, interesting. Huh. Wow. Uh, yeah. Hmm. That sounds believable. <laughs> no, I would, I would imagine that's that makes sense. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I do have a little bit of a, um, I have this, this sort of problem in my, um, in this Psalm a little bit, uh, where he says in verse four, well, he says three, I, I, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So Nathan has kind of, the prophet Nathan has, has thrown this at, at um, or helped David discover the, the depth of his, of his sin. But then he says, against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. That bothers me a little bit. I know that he's having this conversation with God, this kind of, I'm wiped out, you know, sort of completely exposed, naked before God kind of thing. But your transgression is against Bathsheba and against, I can't say her husband's name. Uriah. Uriah, thank you. And your sin is against, you know, I mean, in a sense, kind of your kingdom and the way you've been exercising your power. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of what I would call horizontal sin that you've committed. Um, but this seems to be kind of what I would call a vertical moment for David with God. Uh, it just bug, it just bugs me <laughs> a little bit. So um, it's a beautiful psalm, a beautiful word of of, of uh, repentance. But um, that particular piece is makes me feel like David is still a little bit on his ivory tower throne, and not so much understanding all of, all of whom he's affected. So, and there'll be consequences too from this act. The baby dies, and all kinds of things, different things happen. Um, that kind of our natural consequences out of this, out of his actions. Yeah. Other things though that are hitting people or, or other phrases maybe you like or are curious about in this psalm. Well, I think David knows God's character, knows that he's merciful and forgiving and that he can and will do this. You know, he's not, he was, he was really dishonest and deceitful leading up to this with how he handled the Uriah thing. And um, this, he's, this is, I don't know, this is like honest and, mm -hmm. and, going to God, you know, uh, he has nothing left. He's empty. He's, mm -hmm. he's trash. Yeah. You know, right. And, but he still knows God's character mm -hmm. and that he, that he's capable of forgiving and that he wants to forgive him. Yeah. Yeah. And seems to be completely reliant on that grace mm -hmm. <laughs> and nothing of his own. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a sense of awareness. Um, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. I have sinned against you. I've done what is evil. Um, but there's nothing... Um, there's nothing that, to me, indicates a movement. I'm trying to think if I... You know, he, he doesn't say, you know, I mean, it's created me a clean heart of God and put a new and right spirit within me. Like completely new <laughs> reset yeah. uh, entirely there doesn't seem to be i mean there's an action that follows that if we get down to 13 then i will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you deliver me from bloodshed oh god oh god of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance so he recognizes a response 
that there isn't some sort of like, how about this? How about if I come this far and then you come, and like, I'll come 10%, you come 90 or 50, 50 or whatever the percentages might be. It's a complete um, crying out from the, from the bottom for sure. Yeah, yeah. Other insights, thoughts? I have a note in here that says, I, I never know how to say this, ex nihilo creation. Oh, yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it, ex, it looks like ex nihilo. Yeah, nihilo, yeah. nihilo. I thought you said that, ex nihilo, that's how I say it, yeah. Yeah, so out of nothing. Yeah, right. So you have a note there that's kind of... I just, somebody... Some smart person said that and I wrote it down. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Oh, I remember saying that. No, I'm kidding. That was I'm that joking. Was I don't think it was me. Uh, yeah, so out of nothing. So there's there's a fullness of creation again. Kind of draws back to Genesis that way. Yeah, yeah. In the midst of nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, let's spend a little time on our uh, on First Timothy. And it'll be First Timothy 1. Can, our, can I say one more? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead, um, please. I think he believes that he'll be forgiven too, because that's something that I have struggled with a little bit mm -hmm. is for, forgiving and believing that I'm forgiven mm -hmm. and not rehashing it over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. As as you know. <laughs> well, I know it. I know, I know, I know it even without you. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> even without your help, I know. Yes, yes. But um but that I think this is really powerful that way that he he's done this really he can't do much worse than what he did no no and he knows he's going to be forgiven yeah he's bold enough to ask for it and he knows mm -hmm. that it will happen yeah and he doesn't lose the covenant promise doesn't doesn't get lost in he's that God doesn't bad. God doesn't say ooh I'm a Davidic covenant we're going to make it a Solomonic covenant maybe that was just too hard for God to say but <laughs> you know. We're gonna make maybe we'll maybe we'll just make that be Solomon, or I'll make that be, or not Solomon. I'll make that be. I can't remember what David's son's names were, but I'll make it be with one of them instead. Solomon was one of them. Solomon was one of them. Yeah. yeah no, I keep reversing him. Sorry. It's um, I am rusty coming back. But yes, that 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 it would be that covenant, or it would be a covenant with some king down the line. Or Saul. It's not the Saul covenant. It's <laughs> yeah. That's where I was going. Um, but yeah. God sticks with that. It becomes, I mean, Jesus even is the is the son of David, son of God, son of David. So that sticks, even so. All right, we're going to be in First Timothy. Uh, our text is twelve to seventeen, but I want to read this first part because I think this this helped me. Some, sometimes we get such these snippets of these letters, and they're really complete works that I can kind of gloss over a little bit with the particular part of the letter. So I think it's important to read the, what Paul says first and then where he goes from that. So I'm gonna start with verse, uh, let's see. I'm gonna start with verse three. There's just this greeting. So, so context here, Paul is writing to Timothy and Timothy is a young man. Um, I kind of compare him a little bit with Jeremiah. Um, he's a little happier than Jeremiah, but, but uh, uh, but he is this young man who's kind of unsure, and and Paul is really encouraging him and lifting him up and helping him, um, mentoring him to, into leadership. So he's greeted he's greeted Timothy, and he says, "I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus. So that's where Timothy is. Now, that you may instruct certain people not to teach different teachings and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations, rather than the divine training that is known by faith." But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the righteous, but for the lawless and disobedient for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who engage in illicit sex, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whoever else is, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms 
the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I was entrusted. Now we get into our text. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience as an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal and visible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes into a charge with Timothy, Timothy and instruction. So as I look at that, here's what I see. In the, especially in this 8 through 11. Godless, sinful, unholy, profane, murderers, parent killers, immoral, illicit, perjurers, all of this kind of stuff. And I think if you read just that part and you stopped before we get to our text, it would be like, yeah, 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 all those people, all those people, all those people. But then what does Paul do, right? He's mentoring a young person. And he says, of all these things I've listed, I'm number one. I, and, and he, he, so he starts from this position of God has lifted me up from being one of those who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those from a, from a sense of finger pointing. You know, I can, as I read that part, I can almost feel myself growing. This is really stereotypical. Sorry, Facebook and you guys too, but growing the pompadour and, you know, getting the like televangelist and you're this and you're that, and you better do this and you better do that kind of hellfire and brimstone. Um, Pastor Bill referenced it a couple of Sundays ago, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God kind of a thing. And Paul doesn't look to Timothy and say, and, and we're not like that. You know, we're perfect. Look up to me. But Paul says, the only reason I am where I am is because God reached down, picked me up. <laughs> well, he knocked him off his horse first. But then he picked him up and put him on his shoulders and brought him to this place so that people could look and say, wait a second, that guy murdered us. That guy had us brought back to Jerusalem for trials before the, before the court. Um, you know, that guy celebrated when Stephen was stoned to death. If, if God trans can do that kind of a transformation, what is there that God cannot do? What sin is there that God cannot reach and redeem? Um, kind of a, how far is the East from the West kind of a moment. Uh, that that Paul has here, I think. So we're not going to read that first part, but I love that Paul puts himself into that low place in order to say, I'm an example because of what Christ has done. So look to that, teach in that way. That's what you follow, Timothy. Um, anyway, that hit me, that hit me kind of hard when I did the before and after. <laughs> so, but anyway, other things that are stepping out here, and I know we're kind of getting... It's just a couple minutes left, so. In fact, I actually like, he says, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He's almost saying, because, <laughs> I guess he's saying because of my ignorance, but it's almost like, to me, I hear that almost like, because I made this mistake, Christ acted, acted mercifully for me. It's almost like, um, yeah, I don't know. Doesn't he like say that. in Romans somewhere that he, he allows sin or something so that he can be merciful? Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. How How's that verse? Is. Yeah. Where is that? Yeah. I have to look that one up. But uh, yeah, for God has consigned everyone to sin. Yeah. So that he may have mercy on them all. Yeah. What what is that 
Oh, it's 1132. 1132, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or bound everyone over to disobedience. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I haven't done a walk through <laughs> the scriptures like Pastor Bill has done with the Thursday or the or the Sunday classes. I sometimes envy those walks, those deep walks through the through scriptures i was just thinking that because i know that it was a pretty deep walk through romans so yeah yeah well let's end on that note then with paul's words to timothy and perhaps to us as well we'll close with a word of prayer gracious and loving god we do give you thanks for your grace for your mercy uh for your seeking uh we pray that we would be found in you uh, always as part of your family and part of your flock, and that we would um, be looking with eyes as you as you see us and as you see the world. Um, and whether that's just around the corner for us or in some bigger way, we pray that our hearts would be open and uh, seeking where your word would be heard and where it would lift and um, anoint and call out those who are uh, your children. And so uh, we pray that we may be not only receivers of hope and grace this day, but also givers of that as well um, as we follow you. Rally us, comfort us, um, ignite us as a church in this community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I finish with one thought? Absolutely. I, I had always thought that they had dogs helping. I really did, even the biblical times, because of, yeah. of my life. But no reference is there of dogs anywhere in the Bible yeah. that I could see while we were having Bible study. Yeah, I was searching oh. other places of any mention of that. In fact, it seems like dogs were like, uh, under the table, you know, fill the scraps to the dogs. It felt like they were they were nothing. Yeah. Not like we have exalted them to be, you know, our companions today. So that exactly. was that was that was very uh, eye opening to me because I just figured because of my my lap my life that the dogs were part of the of the herd. <laughs> so yeah, no, right, exactly. And and you're right. They they were they were seen. Uh, I mean there's one point where this really wonderful I love this reading. It used to bother me a lot, but I love it now. But where Jesus says, you know, we're not going to throw the children's food to the dogs. And he's basically calling this woman who's crying out to him, you know, she's part of this of the dogs of these Gentiles. And yeah. and so they were they were definitely seen as as kind of um underfoot and lesser and kind of wild wow. roaming and not, not put to use and not not definitely not pets i mean to say to go up to somebody's child in that day and say oh my gosh you're as cute as a puppy would you know <laughs> probably be more of an insult or it just wouldn't be something that would be part of their language at all so yeah, yeah. yep yeah. yep you're right <laughs> good research way to go way to be on the ball there yeah thank you very much bye yep, thanks for joining in margo all right bye, bye. Oh, good. Yeah, one more. Yeah, one.